Welcome to another episode of Optimal Anesthesia, where we plunge into the realm of medical discoveries, their historical significance, and their vital role in shaping our approach to patient care. Today we're delving into a critical aspect of anesthesiology, how anesthesiologists respond to nerve agent attacks. It's an intense journey through time and medicine, exploring the challenges faced by these medical professionals and the scientific intricacies behind their life-saving techniques. So, join me as we uncover the fascinating world of optimal anesthesia in the face of unforeseen emergencies. Buckle up for a gripping exploration into the evolving landscape of medical preparedness. Today, we dive into the clandestine world of G-Series nerve agents, beginning with their accidental discovery in 1936 by Gerhard Schrader's team in Germany. Tabun, the first agent, showcased its deadly potential in insect experiments but revealed its true horror in a tragic lab accident in 1937. The G-Series expanded with sarin in 1938 and Soman in 1944, each more potent than the last. During World War II, the United States named these agents Tabun as GA, sarin as GB, and Soman as GD. German production facilities were established, leading to the use of Tabun in wartime operations. Post-World War II, chemical warfare persisted. The Iran-Iraq War saw large-scale use of chemical weapons, and the Aum Shinrikyo Group shocked the world with the Tokyo subway sarin attack. Modern instances include sarin in the 2013 Ghouta attack, VX in Kim Jong-nam's assassination, 2017, and Novichok poisonings in the UK, 2018. Beyond warfare, the ocean became a dumping ground for chemical weapons in 1972, sparking ecological and health concerns that persist due to poor record-keeping. German forces refrained from using nerve agents in World War II, and the Gulf War, though lacking nerve agents, left a legacy of exposure incidents and Gulf War syndrome. Nerve agents, the stuff of spy novels and international intrigue. Now, to make this complex topic a bit more digestible, let's break it down into four main classes. G-Series nerve agents, first up, we have the G-Series, named after those clever German scientists. Picture this, World War II, clandestine labs, and the birth of some seriously toxic chemicals. We've got Tabun, Sarin, Soman, and Cycloserin. Sarin, also known as GB, takes the spotlight here, being the only G agent the US deployed in munitions. These are non-persistent agents, meaning they're like the Houdinis of the chemical world, here one moment, gone the next. V-series nerve agents, next on our list is the V-series, the persistent troublemakers. VE, VG, VM, VR, and the notorious VX. VX is the rock star of the V-agents, hanging around on surfaces like a stubborn houseguest. Developed in the 1950s, VX is primarily a skin hazard. Imagine it as the clingy X of nerve agents, hard to shake off. The US was fond of VX, fielding it in various munitions. Novichok agents, now, let's fast forward a bit to the Cold War era. Enter Novichok, the James Bond villains of nerve agents. Developed by the Soviet Union and Russia, these guys are like the stealth bombers of the chemical world. Designed to slip past NATO detectors and defy protective gear, the Novichok program birthed some seriously lethal chemical weapons. Talk about a game of chemical cat and mouse. Carbamates, and here's the curveball, not all nerve agents are cut from the same chemical cloth. Introducing Carbamates, the rebels of the nerve agent world. During the Cold War, both the US and the Soviet Union explored carbamate-based nerve agents, like EA 1464. These guys are three times as toxic as VX, and despite being quite different from Novichok agents, they share a spot on the banned agents list. A surprising twist in the nerve agent saga. Now, you have heard of nerve agents, but what really happens when these chemicals wreak havoc inside our bodies? 
Buckle up as we break down the dramatic and deadly dance between nerve agents and our nervous system. Let's start with the basics. Our nerves are like conductors in a symphony, and acetylcholine is their musical note. Every time a nerve wants to communicate with a muscle or organ, it plays the acetylcholine note. Enter the villain's nerve agents. These sneaky substances pull a heist on our nerves by handcuffing the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, the custodian responsible for clearing the stage after the note is played. Now, imagine a spy thriller where nerve agents interfere with the secret agent called hydrolysis, preventing it from erasing the musical note. Result? The stage is set for chaos. With acetylcholine piling up, nerves keep playing their notes non-stop. This leads to a cacophony of signals, causing muscles to contract uncontrollably. It's like a symphony turning into a heavy metal concert against your will. Picture this, a runny nose, constricted pupils, and a tight chest, the opening act. Soon, difficulty breathing, nausea, and involuntary bodily functions take the center stage. It's a rapid descent into a medical thriller. Now, the climax, the cholinergic crisis. Muscles refuse to relax. Paralysis spreads like wildfire. It's the ultimate showdown between life and death, and the clock is ticking. But the story doesn't end there. Survivors face chronic neurological damage, like a haunting epilogue that lingers for years. Blurred vision, tiredness, and more, it's the aftermath of a nerve agent's sinister performance. Picture this, military personnel in stressful conditions facing a nerve agent threat. The first line of defense? Auto injectors. Meet the ATNAA or antidote treatment nerve agent auto-injector. It's a lifesaver, containing a powerful combo of anticholinergic and oxim. Now, let's talk anticholinergics. Atropine takes the spotlight, acting as a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor antagonist. Dosing at 0.02 mg per kilogram, it counters the effects of excess acetylcholine. But here's the twist, some synthetics like biperidin might steal the show, especially when the central nervous system is in the spotlight. Enter the hero in the oxum world, pralidoxine chloride, 2 PAMCL. Dosing at 15 to 25 mg slash kg, it directly combats the nerve agent by reactivating acetylcholinesterase. But here's the cool part, it complements atropine by working more effectively on nicotinic receptors. Wondering when to stop the atropine party? It's when the bronchial secretions clear. Atropine is like the cleanup crew, managing symptoms and putting the brakes on excess acetylcholine. Uh oh, seizures. Time for the cavalry, anticonvulsants like diazepam. Dosing at 0.1 to 0.3 mg slash kg, it's the hero that improves long-term prognosis and reduces the risk of brain damage. But remember, it's not for self-administration, reserved for those actively seizing. Let's talk countermeasures. First up, pyridostigmine bromide. A pretreatment before nerve agent exposure, it plays well with atropine and pralidoxine. Dosing at 30 mg every 8 hours, it's the strategic move that reduces fatality rates, but with a potential risk, brain damage. Q anticonvulsants for mitigation. The future is here, or almost. Buteral cholinesterase, a prophylactic countermeasure against nerve agents. Dosing? Well, that's still in the lab imagine it as a superhero binding nerve agents in the bloodstream before they wreak havoc. It might just be the safer alternative to pyridostigmine. Last but not least, let's explore biological scavengers. Purified acetylcholinesterase and butyl cholinesterase are guardians in animal studies. Dosing? 
Stay tuned for research studies to determine the magic number. These biological wonders offer stoichiometric protection against a spectrum of nerve agents. As we wrap up this chilling tale, remember, the shadows hold secrets that can shape destinies. Stay curious and remember, knowledge is the best antidote. This is Optimal Anesthesia, signing off.